Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats, get your laptops out, the power cables are in front, and it's nine o'clock and we're going to get started. Uh, good morning, my name is Pinda, uh, pin the tail on the donkey, that's the way to remember my name. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong and I am, happen to be the, uh, the chair of the conference, and I'd just like to say a few words about um, some context. Uh, Many of you have basically, in goodwill, gone on a plane to come here. Obviously, the program is very important as the camaraderie. So I just want to cover sort of the very high-level concepts uh, before I introduce Jeremy Rubin, our program chair. And that goes back to the genesis of this two-phase process that we have. Obviously, phase one starts today uh, in Montreal and phase two in December in Hong Kong. So you've read from the websites what I call the, like the five no's, right? This is not a mailing list, right? There are no sales, no marketing. There are no debates and no decisions. So why on earth are you coming here? Well, the reason why you're here is really what I would call, it's like a diamond in the rough. We're looking at really what I would call the five C's, which is, first of all, conduct. Each of you before you should have a code of conduct, uh, which um, basically outlines the, the way that we will create the second C, which is a collegial atmosphere for the third C, which is uh, uh, basically communication. And we hope that in this safe space, with the code of conduct, with your badges clearly defined, with the chat, that we'll be able to create some kind of collaboration. And with that collaboration, we hope that the ultimate goal <laughs> is working on the social consensus. So with that, let me introduce uh, Jeremy Rubin, our program chair, who will take us through the day. Jeremy, over to you. Thanks, Pindar. Hey, everyone. We've got a really exciting and jam-packed program for you today. We'll kick off the morning with a number of talk sessions, lunch, then some interactive roundtables, a summary session, an invited talk from Gabriella Coleman, and we'll be wrapping up with an opening reception at 6.30. Tomorrow's schedule is similar. Check the program for exact details. A couple administrative notes about the structure of the event. Speakers, please come to the front of the room over there where Brian is uh, before your scheduled talk, so in the, in the talk right before. We will not be running a live Q&A. Um, this is very important. However, we will be able to take questions via Google form with answers uh, by speakers posted online later. You can find the form prominently featured on the scalingbitcoin.org website. The main reason for not doing live questions is our tight schedule. However, it's also important because good technical responses take time to properly generate. The roundtable discussions will take place under the Chatham House rule. It's relatively simple to understand. You can use what people say, but not who said it. This rule fosters a more open channel of communication. In general, please treat all of the workshop as if it were under Chatham House rule by default. This will help create a collaborative and respectful space. I'll share more about the workshops after lunch. If you're tweeting, our hashtag, as you can see, is Scaling Bitcoin, and IRC uh, will be hanging out on channel Bitcoin workshops. We have a small warm-up exercise for all of you today. Everyone ready? Take out your phone. Take them out. Uh, now you can take a glamorous photo of me. <laughs> and then uh, please put them on silent so that we can have the uh, kind of optimal uh, background noise of no distracting calls. Lastly, I want to give a shout out to everyone who has been volunteering hundreds of hours of hard work to make this event happen, particularly our local host, Anton, who is uh, probably somewhere in the back, um, because you know, there's been a lot going on to put this all together. However, the hardest and most important work is now, and it's on all of us. In order for this event to really be a success, we are all going to need uh, to set aside past grudges and open our ears, eyes, and mind. I think if you're sitting right here now, you know this to be true. So let's do our best and make Satoshi proud. Without further ado, let's get to our first talk. slide set up. All right. Well, I'll just start then uh, without slides. So, um, okay, maybe not. OK, 
Thank you. My name is Brian Bishop. I work with LedgerX, and LedgerX is pursuing uh, regulatory approval from the CFTC for Bitcoin options and clearing. And two days ago, we received notification that we were approved for temporary registration for operating a swap execution facility. So my approach for a review of Bitcoin scaling proposals was an attempt at thorough review. I reviewed uh, all bitcointalk.org forum posts in the technical subforum, but also all email uh, from the Bitcoin dev mailing list. Uh, and some parts of the IRC logs, although not everything, someone else will have to do that. Um, so this is not, these proposals are not my own. These are from the community. Um, people who made these proposals are here today and you should track them down and talk with them and coordinate. Um, so it's very difficult to listen to all proposals. Um, all ideas are hidden uh, among uh, anonymous authors, anonymous authors, uh, or authors that we know. Uh, for some reasons and others, some authors choose to remain anonymous and that must be respected. Uh, so it's very hard to sort through signal and noise, but we must do so anyway. Um, some of the original uh, complaints about Bitcoin Core was the slow initial sync of the early blockchain. So m many of the early proposals were about this problem. Uh, however, there are other problems that remain. Uh, I'm gonna skip scaling, we have, we're short on time, but um, curves for scaling laws, you should know this. Uh, so I wanted to start with imagining what the theoretical maximum scale is of anything. How much could we use if we could, uh, how many transactions per second could we do if we convert the entire universe into transaction processing capacity? Um, which is an interesting question that I imagine Ralph Merkel has thought about. Uh, everyone here knows Ralph Merkel because of cryptography, whereas I know him because of cryonics and molecular nanotechnology. Um, but the idea is that if you could simulate people's brains, you could put them on a computer in the cloud, and then they won't have to actually create transactions between each other because we could just look at what they're trying to do. Perhaps that will solve the problem. Um, but um, coming back a little bit closer to reality, instead we could say, well, what if we wanted to do centralization? What is the maximum possible amount of transactions per second that we could imagine? And uh, a little bit scaled back from that is that using modern ASICs, we could probably get a few billion transactions per second uh, if we were willing to do so. Um, you know, throw everything into a Postgres database, um, get rid of pay to pub key hash, uh, and go from there. Um, what's interesting is that this is already better than the modern banking system. Uh, but yet it's still worse than Bitcoin. Um, so what if we go back even further back to reality? So we have to wonder what is the correct scale? What are we aiming for here? Is there a point at which too many transactions is unhealthy? Um, but what are we scaling? Um, I think an important priority is financial safety, uh, mining and privacy, um, the transaction verification rate, uh, trustlessness is very important as well. Um, in Bitcoin, we have this unfortunate problem of conflating the number of transactions and the number of users, uh, or even the number of addresses and the number of users. If you have a few million wallets on your site, does that mean you have a few million users, or does that mean you have a few million wallets? Uh, so it's very hard to count uh, the number of nodes and so on. So there are some trade-offs in Bitcoin. You have to trade off between efficiency and security sometimes, or between cost and benefit or bandwidth invariance in mining. And in particular, when we're designing software solutions for scaling, we have to also keep in mind that we're looking at the worst case of the network because of cyber attacks, uh, instead of just looking at best case or average case. So with these trade-offs in mind, what are the bottlenecks? Transaction verification, again, is a very important one. The peer-to-peer -peer gossip network is another important one. These bottlenecks are where we have to uh, look if we're going to increase the scale. So the solutions that I'm going to be presenting have a lot to do with uh, some very common data structures, the most important of which is a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is a hash tree, which is the idea of each uh, node in the tree being a hash of the children of the node. Uh, that appears everywhere in Bitcoin and it's very important. So the first proposal was in the original Bitcoin white paper, which was simplified payment verification. The idea is that you can have lightweight clients that do not require full node security uh, using transaction verification using the Merkle root and block headers so that you can look up whether a transaction was actually included. And you get slightly less security in exchange for uh, uh, node optimizations. You do not need a massive node to run this. 
Um, another optimization that was made was headers first as of version 0 0.10 of Bitcoin Core. Um, with headers first, this greatly improved the blockchain sync uh, for new users. Uh, many proposals are based on pruning. With pruning, the idea is that you can either prune the unspent transaction output set or the UTXO set, or you can prune the local blockchain that is stored on the hard drive, uh, or you can prune um, old transaction, old coins. Uh, you can prune op return data, although that's highly controversial. Um, and so is, for that matter, uh, returning old unused coins to the network. That is also controversial. However, pruning does help. Um, another uh, interesting data structure and technique is bloom filtering, where you have um, no false negatives, but you trade that off for um, having false positives. And this is an efficient data structure for looking up the presence or inclusion of a member of a set, which is often used in many proposals for uh, checking transaction inclusion or block inclusion or outputs. Uh, another proposal, of course, is just use distributed hash tables. This is a joke slide. Uh, many other proposals are uh, those that involve unspent transaction output commitments. Instead of just having committed transactions in block headers, you can have the unspent transactions that are committed in the headers. This allows lightweight clients to look up uh, their outputs inside of this Merkle root data structure. Um, we can actually soft fork the requirement that UTXO commitments be valid, um, but the commitment itself has to be optional. Um, and there's also some validating, um, validation incentive problems. Uh, related to this that have to be solved. So you can um, do a commitment on the unspent transaction outputs or you can do commitments on the spent transaction outputs. And this uh, is relevant because the way you go decides whether you can query in certain ways in this data set. So a specific proposal for this was to have a fixed size unspent transaction output set. You prune the old uh, transaction outputs and you make the wallets provide proofs that the old transaction outputs are still valid based off of other block headers that they're able to assemble. Um, the idea is that we could have a way to make a fixed cost full node that does not vary over time with the size or the scale of the network. Uh, IBLT, invertible bloom lookup tables, was an idea for uh, constant time propagation of blocks on the network. Relay Network is going to be talked about shortly after my presentation, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, of course, we're all familiar with max block size proposals. Um, there have been proposals for increasing, decreasing, and keeping the block size the same, and many variations of this that I'm also going to be skipping. Uh, merge mining is an interesting method for having alternate chains that are secured by the same hash rate for miners that are interested in securing both chains of Bitcoin and an auxiliary chain. Uh, they are independent, although the auxiliary chain is capable of having block headers from the Bitcoin blockchain inside of their blockchain, and th their clients are made to be compatible with this. Um, another proposal that was mentioned in the community was fidelity bonded ledgers. Uh, the idea is that you take out everything from Bitcoin except transaction and scripting, no minor validation for the most part, uh, and this would require fidelity bonds and possibly fraud proofs as well. Uh, Sidechains are also something that has recent mindshare. I'm going to skip this as well. There's a paper that should be read. Uh, this is a diagram of sidechains. Extension blocks were proposed on the mailing list a while back and on the forum even earlier, um, where you have a soft fork to include an, ex uh, an extra block where transactions can be placed. Um, fee pressure differences between the main blockchain and these extension blocks might choose or inform user preferences for where they put their unspent transaction outputs. Tree chains were another idea that uh, involved less minor validation where you have a proof of publication system primarily. Um, all the complexity is pushed off to the transaction receivers. Um, oh, another important point of tree chains and uh, similar proposals is that you have the wallets provide the UTXOs themselves instead of relying on the network to keep the UTXOs. So this pushes the complexity not only to the transaction receivers, but also to some of the senders. Uh, Cross-chain swaps, I'm gonna skip for now. Probabilistic payments was the idea that uh, there is a difference between transactions and payments. Payments can be made uh, independent of actual transactions. Um, you can have a signed contract mechanism for uh, paying someone one one hundredth of a Bitcoin, um, and this would be a, 
have a probability of being paid in actual Bitcoin. It's a sort of lottery scheme. There were many lottery micropayment schemes prior to Bitcoin. Um, so using that knowledge might help us towards probabilistic payments. Uh, which brings us to uh, proof of work payment, which is the idea that you can make your receiver of your Bitcoin transaction uh, essentially a mining pool and then you mine for them and that's your payment because you can use proof of work as evidence that you have uh, some economic burn rate, I guess, is a, is a simplification. Uh, and this has interesting privacy benefits as well. So before I get to payment channels, there's this concept of cut through, which is that if you are transacting to 200 different people and those 200 different people all pay the same person, and if you're willing to forego um, fast confirmations, then you might as well just skip the intermediate step and you can press all these transactions at the same time uh, and then only have one transaction to the final destination. That's the concept of cut through. Um, payment channels are a mechanism for doing something similar, except you have an open channel where you can send money back and forth to someone. And this has been evolved into a concept for a network of hubs or nodes that are communicating with each other through and providing payment routing. Uh, there is a paper for this as well. I'm going to skip this because it has recent mindshare and there is a, a talk as well. Um, this is a diagram that shows the Lightning Network. It's, it's just reinforcing the idea that there are sequences of transactions that have to be pre-signed before you fund them uh, for revocation and um, hash time lock commitments and commitment transactions as well. Many proposals use fraud proofs, which is the idea of uh, being able to prove that fraud was committed. If we were to convert the entire Bitcoin system into acquiring fraud proofs, we would need each of the verifications that miners perform to be capable of proving uh, fraudulent, such as false minting or inflation. Um, every check that is in Bitcoin Core would have to be, uh, every consensus check in Bitcoin Core would have to be converted into this style. Uh, which brings us to proof of treachery, which is the idea that perhaps you could have a single node on the network performing everything that is Bitcoin. Uh, and as long as it is truthful and following the rules, no one would send fraud proofs. Um, and you could also imagine that invalid state transitions would be either impossible or at least provable that they were invalid. Many proposals use something called snark succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. The idea is that you can prove faithful execution of code, uh, which is a really neat concept. Uh, check the witness instead of executing the code yourself. Uh, it is sublinear in size of the length of the execution or the number of operations in the execution. So you can prove this without, provi without uh, rerunning the code. Um, so one example might be a validated history replacement where you take the prior blockchain and just toss it out and you provide instead a giant chunk of validation instead that is a proof that the prior blockchain existed. A uh, similar idea is where you have an unspent transaction output uh, commitment where you have proofs of authorized modifications for either um, adding or removing UTXOs. And again, wallets would be providing some of these proofs to receivers and two miners. Uh, this would provide sublinear blockchain growth. Um, now there are some limitations to this. One is that it's trusted setup. Um, provers are very slow. Uh, right now it would not work for Bitcoin. Um, there's untested cryptography here and there was a recent uh, security hole in LibSnark, which is very interesting. That's a link to the paper. Um, I believe that uh, interesting directions to look into would be include publicly verifiable computation, uh, multi-party computation, remote attestation, um, and also different SIG hash types will also provide scaling benefits. Just like with Lightning Network using this idea of being able to um, sign a transaction before you fund it, um, you can use that in many other scenarios as well. Um, so if we could find a way to get the blockchain to grow uh, with respect to time sublinearly, or have a constant size. I think that would have huge scaling benefits that would be quite profound. Basically, that's the holy grail. Um, wallets providing their own unspent transaction outputs and proofs would also be a huge benefit. Um, it's interesting to note that we don't actually care what the history is as long as it doesn't change. Um, and as Andrew Miller pointed out once, most of Bitcoin and everything that's interesting in Bitcoin or cryptography turns out to be Merkle trees and then complicated variations of other cryptography on top of Merkle trees. Uh, 
So when I was doing this review of BitcoinTalk.org and the mailing list, I produced many bookmarks. There's a link here. You can get this in the presentation on the IRC channel. We'll have a link. Um, I'm also collecting Bitcoin technology inventions, and this is going to be used to produce a wiki page that summarizes a lot of things that might have been missed. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Bitcoin Relay Network. Uh, this is not a talk about block compression necessarily. Uh, I know some of you might have been expecting that. This is more a talk about uh, centralization pressure in how we relay blocks in general. I think Rusty's going to talk a lot more about some of the fancier block compression schemes that a lot of people have been working on. Um, do I do it? Oops. <laughs> okay, um, so the Relay Network started a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Um, and at the time, there were really two big concerns that a lot of people had in the Bitcoin ecosystem, at least that the Relay Network was trying to partially address. Uh, the first was the number of listening nodes across the network was drastically declining, uh, which, is two uh, which is indicative of two issues. Uh, first is that a lot of people are reducing their security model and choosing to not validate fully Bitcoin so that they're payments are potentially significantly less secure. Um, that's not really something the Relay Network tries to address, but it is a major issue. Uh, but the really big issue with number of listening nodes decreasing that the Relay Network can sort of address is that this decreases the network's um, resilience against attack rather significantly. Uh, so if we only have 100 listening nodes, then there's only 100 mostly VPSs that you have to go knock offline before the network starts to become really hard to get connected to, really hard to, it starts, stops working, mostly. Um, this is potentially really easy because knocking off 100 or 1,000 nodes is actually not that hard. Uh, so the Relay Network is a pseudo alternative. Um, it's not designed to be as efficient, at least for getting everything out, and it's certainly not something you can sync from initially, but it's like a pseudo centralized second network that you can connect to. Uh, Another big issue, and this is really the larger motivation for the Relay Network, was at the time a lot of people were worried about the selfish mining attack. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about what it is, but essentially the paper claimed, and it is mostly true, that uh, you can, with 33% of the mining power, essentially pull off a short-term 51% attack. Uh, and this is much easier, in fact, and you can do this with significantly less mining power if you have better visibility into the way the network is laid out and you have better connection into the network than anyone else. And at the time especially, and in fact even still today to some extent, we have very little visibility into the way the network is laid out. And I know there's some people here who've done really good research trying to figure this out and trying to map it out, but still uh, there's a lot of potential for someone to connect both smartly and to a lot of nodes and get much better uh, visibility into when a block is announced. So yeah, the Relay Network can sort of address that. I'm going to get into. So uh, basically what it is, when it started, it was just a bunch of random nodes around the globe that are trying to get a bunch of miners to peer with it. Um, and this seemed to work pretty well, right? We can get a bunch of miners connected, and it doesn't filter blocks, which means the selfish miner, you can't gain an advantage because everyone's just connected to the same network, or at least the same network has good connectivity, uh, and especially for small miners, right? If you're a big miner, you can potentially gain a big advantage and pull off a selfish mining attack or something, but if you're a small miner, 
you don't have time to invest to build a giant relay network. Um, yeah, so no. Uh, so yeah, so it started as just some centralized nodes that just did SPV validation and relayed things quickly, uh, but that actually wasn't very quick because Java in a low latency server environment doesn't work. Uh, so now it is much smarter. It does some pseudo compression uh, where it takes each transaction in a block and just says, oh yeah, instead of sending the whole transaction, it can just say that transaction I sent you five transactions ago. Yeah, that one. And it does pretty well. Um, so these are two graphs. One is when I gave this talk a few weeks ago and the other one is from the last two days. <laughs> You'll notice they're very different. So the yellow line is the uh, actual block size and then the red jagged thing is the amount of bytes sent over the relay network. Uh, in general, when the network is functioning normally, <laughs> the graph on, I guess, your left is what you'd see. The one on the right is uh, because right now the network is filled with a lot of spam that all has the same transaction per kilobyte rate or uh, fee per kilobyte rate, uh, which causes some problems and there's some issues filed on GitHub's and you can see uh, it's not actually trivial to get rid of. You kind of have to rework the way mining is done in Bitcoin Core slightly. So um, <laughs> this is a map of the various nodes in the relay network. And it's very interesting because I had to spend a lot of time to come up with this topology. It's actually not trivial. So routing in Asia is generally terrible, especially into mainland China. Uh, if you're routing from mainland China to almost anywhere else, essentially it goes through Japan and then LA. So if you're not in Japan, you're not gonna get it. And if you're trying to get to Europe, you don't wanna go through the US. Turns out there is a cable through Siberia, but the only way to get that is if you have a node in Siberia that you can route through. So yeah, I had to spend a bunch of time figuring this out. And small miners are not gonna do this because they don't have time to figure this out. Big miners might because it can potentially save them significant orphan rate, but peer-to-peer -peer network is not gonna find a quick route from Beijing to Amsterdam through Siberia. This is not something that a randomly laid out network is necessarily just gonna figure out on its own. Um, so there's a big tension here, right, between a distributed network that we can just throw nodes at and it can relay blocks quickly and something that's gonna shave off tens of seconds and several percent of orphan rate because it's centrally designed and centrally planned and um, actually works well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a huge um, opportunity cost to just not using the style of centralized network. Oops, this got cut off. I don't know what that says. Um, anyway, so this is a wonderful graph of time to relay things around the network. And this is really relevant for, block, si or for block transmission around the network uh, because you can see on the, they're both log axis, but on the left axis you can see and the vertical axis, you can see the block size that's actually sent over the wire, only up to one megabyte. And on the bottom, you can see how many milliseconds it took to get around the globe. And there's a very strong correlation after you send a few packets. And the relay network often sends things in you know, one or two TCP packets. But after you get past that, you start to have a very strong correlation. And in fact, this is indicative of how TCP behaves across long haul links. And as it turns out, it has nothing to do with the fact that all of these servers have gigabit links or 100 megabit links directly to backbone connections. It actually just has to do with the latency and the packet loss. Once you lose a packet or two, things start to slow down rather significantly and you end up with a few RTTs. And by the way, that 10 second that you see all the way on the right, or right side, that is eh, 1.5% lost revenue for miners, which is rather significant. So yeah, um, I'm also here to ask for help because this project is something I've been running by myself for quite a while uh, and I would love for anyone to contribute. There's a GitHub, there's easy issues file that you can go read. Um, it's pretty simple and it improves the effective hash power of Bitcoin just with software. 
Uh, also, there's a roundtable in network propagation later. If you want to dive deep on all of these issues, including all kinds of crazy compression stuff with Rusty, he'll be talking in a minute. Definitely come to that. Yeah, thanks. Test, 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 test. Whoa, 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 stop, stop. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Do you know who I am? Oh, oh, come on. Come on, guys. Does anybody know who I am? You know who I am? San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup. Woo! All right. Give it up for San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup. SF Bitcoin Devs. All right. I just got up. I'm sorry. Montreal is a beautiful city. And um, I kicked myself into gear to get here this morning to get you guys a little bit up and running. I just want to say thank you, Matt Crawler, for the presentation. Matt, can we give it up for Matt? Yes. Woo! All right. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, what I've been assigned to do, is to be a little annoying to you guys, so please forgive me, and also to be a little funny, so please laugh. And then lastly, to make sure we keep everybody moving and keep this interesting. So next on the list after Matt is going to be Corey Fields. Corey, are you ready for this? You got some hotness for us? That's okay. It's boring and technical? Oh, yes. Please give it up for Corey. Let's make him feel welcome. I'm not, I'm not driving at the moment. Okay. That, that is me. So I, I want to apologize uh, right off. I'm, I'm here to talk about reworking. This is a Bitcoin Core specific uh, topic. And, and I've been working kind of feverishly over the last few weeks to get some code whipped into shape so I could talk more definitively about working things rather than, than theory. So the, the presentation itself suffered a little bit for that. So uh, B Bitcoin Core has a, a networking stack that, that dates back, I think, all the way back to the uh, initial implementation from, from Satoshi. And, or, or at least it's been, it's been patched and, and kind of hacked on ever since. And it has some pretty serious limitations at the moment. Um, one of the biggest, or I, I guess I should say two of the biggest that, that actually got me kind of whipped into shape for this particular topic is, is there's no throttling, which is, is one of the most requested features that I see um, on, on the network side of things, meaning that it's, it's relatively easy if, if you get a bunch of nodes connected to you for them to just suck away your bandwidth. There's, there's very little that you can do about it. Um, the, the configuration is, is very static, so in, in, in actually hacking on the networking code, you find that it's very hard. If you, just, if you want to do something simple, if you want to uh, disconnect a node, if you want to ban a node, if you want to do things on the fly, it, it's, it's actually much more complicated than you would expect to do things like that. Uh, the same with, um, with uh, diagnoses and simulations and, and testing, be, because of that kind of static configuration, it, it becomes hard to do those things. So the, the other uh, ma major interesting thing that, that really got me into looking at, at the, the, the current networking issues is what I call the peer-to-peer -peer latency, which is a terrible name and it doesn't describe <laughs> a, at all what I'm trying to say. But what I mean by that is, is the lag time between the time that you receive a message, uh, process it, do something with it, and are able to respond or, or um, do something as a result of it. So again, this is, this is pretty core specific. So Bitcoin core developers, I think, will, will recognize some of these things. And um, I'm, I'm sure they could add to, a, add to the list very easily. But some of the, the big issues at the moment, number one, select doesn't scale. So for, for the most part, on, on most Linux systems or most uh, Unix-based systems, you have a, a pretty hard or, or a pretty assumed limit of 1024 file descriptors. So you, you can pretty much say right off, that's, that's, the, that's the limit of connections that you're gonna get. Um, so there, there, there are major 
locking issues, and, and this is very specific to the Bitcoin code itself. So it, it becomes very hard to make any changes to the way that uh, connections work, connections are established, the way that proxies work, the way that uh, basically any, anything regarding uh, sockets and data transmission it is, is just covered covered with locks, covered with, with some crazy code paths, and, and it's it, there, there's some pretty spaghettified code that has emerged over time. Uh, so the, the result of that, and it's, it's something that I'm not sure uh, has been analyzed all that much, but what, what, the, what, what I consider to be one of the major scaling issues at the moment for the networking side of things is how much is done on the message handling thread in, uh, in, in course. So what that means is as we receive messages on the network and process them very quickly, um, there, there's a lot of thread contention because uh, things like block validation, transaction validation, all those things are, are happening on our message handling thread. So as, as more and more starts coming in over the network, we become less and less able to process it. So I haven't seen really many, or, or any proposals, things to, uh, to, to address that particular issue. And, and given the amount of, given, given the, the current code base and, and its, its fragility, I decided to dive in and uh, essentially look at a, a complete rework of the networking code. So here is, this, this is one of my primary motivators. Um, I, I was doing a, a, a sync, the initial block download, a few months ago. And this was the, the before, this is on my, on my MacBook, which is about a year old, I suppose. And, and one of the things I noticed, one of the trends that emerged very quickly was this, this peaks and troughs um, trend. And I, I think most people would see that the, definitely the slower the computer that you're working on, that, that you're trying to sync with, you, you, you would notice that trend uh, e even more strongly. And so what's happening there is, is what I alluded to a minute ago. It's, it's the, the fact that as, as blocks are coming in, as, as data is coming in, we can't process it fast enough because we're doing all this validation and, and headers first actually made this a lot worse because as blocks are coming in out of order, um, you, you may have uh, 15, 20, 30 blocks queued up that don't actually connect until uh, the, the, the right block comes in. So, so there can be tens, uh, tens of seconds or even minutes that go by uh, before you can request a new block. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, the, the, the valleys are, are where the, the um, we're, we're currently churning and chugging away, doing our best to, to validate things, and we're not able to request new blocks coming in. So, so network traffic just drops, and over the long term, you see this drop to, to, to basically zero. So I ran a quick experiment. I, I, I added some new threads to, um, to do some of that, that block handling on a new thread, and this is the result that I got. So I want to make it very clear. This is... The, the award that I, I went ahead and gave myself for the most simplified data here, because that this this says nothing. This is this is not at all useful, but it was enough to prove to me that it is at least possible to offset some of this uh, this this uh, peaks and valley kind of trend. So, I've I've started working in the last few months, and and really I, I've kicked it into high gear over the last few weeks to. Uh, to, to work on just a, a complete replacement for essentially the, the, the networking stack inside of Bitcoin. Um, so more, more threads is kind of traditionally what we've, what we've done to, to, to make Bitcoin core scale. And, and anyone who's done uh, networking and, and kind of on the low level knows that that really doesn't, that, that, that stops being useful at some point. So I started looking at, at things that we could do asynchronously in, instead. So at, at the moment, pretty much everything in core on the networking side is done synchronously. We, we spawn some threads, we, we spawn some connections, we wait for them to connect, and then we, we act on that instead. And so as a result of that pattern, the, the Bitcoin uh, core logic tends to behave the same way. So we wait for network, uh, ne wait, for, wait to establish a connection. Once we have that connection, we start talking to it, we establish. Um, you know, we, we run the handshake and start asking for, for blocks. But as, as, as you try to scale up on the networking side, it becomes much easier if, if you have your network say, I'm connected now, what, what do you want from me? 
so libevent is a, uh, a library that is essentially written to handle these, these kind of issues. It was actually, uh, its usage was just merged into Bitcoin Core for uh, a, a different R RPC server uh, over the last few weeks. So there, there are, in, there, there are a few complaints about adding a new library and depending on, on third-party code for Bitcoin Core for some of the, the core logic of it. But I would say that it's a, it's a pretty well-established library already. There's a lot of things that it does for us um, that, that we do. Like, if, if, you, if you look at this list, it's, it's kind of insane that we do all of these things manually in, in core at the moment. So it handles socket creation, binding, polling, buffering, watermarks, blah, blah, blah. But it, it also handles... Um, uh, prioritization, which is really nice and, and something that is, is very uh, handwritten in core. So you can say this node is more important. Uh, give, give, it, give it a higher priority. Uh, let, it, let it make sure that I know that it's connected before the others or make sure that its data uh, is, is synced before the others. Uh, it, it also uses ePoll, KQ, or uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with IOCP, but it's, it's IOCP is used for Windows where possible, meaning that uh, for, for most Linux systems, for most uh, OS X and BSD systems, we won't be reliant on select anymore. So that, that kind of soft or, or soft-ish limit of 1024 connections that we have at the moment um, just, just kind of goes away. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So this is the approach that I've, that I've taken. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to add the concept of a, a singular connection manager for core that we can we can uh, query it runs it runs an instance we can ask it for it, it doesn't you, you don't you don't say establish a new connection outboard um, it says hey I don't have enough connections G give me somebody connect to to connect to and then after a few seconds it says okay I'm connected what do you want to do so it, it kind of reverses it. it it looks at things from the from the network perspective or from the buffer perspective um, it. it be, because of that, because the, uh, the the direction of thing changes, it also would make it much easier to to kind of reverse that logic in in, in the the core code as well. To to say uh, somebody asked for a block, what, what do you what do you want to do about it? Instead of saying somebody asked for a block, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop everything and go find that block and send it to them, which is what we do now. Um, so in in writing the manager, it became obvious pretty quickly. When, when you're, uh, as, I was, as I was working on the code, to actually establish the, the rules for how, how to manage connections, um, it, it became clear that the, a, a network uh, connection manager itself really doesn't have to know anything about Bitcoin itself. It has to know a bit, um, like two or three things. It has to know uh, how big a header is, what the, what the size, what the message size offset is inside the header, and then as one tiny optimization, it, it knows a little bit about the, the version handshake because the, 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 the first incoming message is where you establish a lot about the, the connection information itself. So you can avoid some races by saying, before, you, before I'm notified about uh, th that I can start sending messages back and forth, do this version handshake and then, and then continue. So in working on this new manager, one of the things that, that or one of my goals that I set out for initially, and, and I've, I've stuck to so far, is uh, writing it as a new standalone library. Um, not that it makes sense to use it that way. It, it would, I, I, don't, I don't imagine this being useful to anybody else or um, being implemented in other programs, but it does make for much easier testing. You can write a, a very quick stub application to say, uh, do, uh, you know, grab, do, do simulate an, an initial initial uh, initial initial block download. Simulate this this scenario without having to deal with all of the other uh, Bitcoin related things that are going on. You can you can test. Um, you know, say you, say you just want to test how easily you can connect it to two thousand nodes, or or how easily you could you could uh, spawn an attack. You can you can write your own little sub applications. Um, that that also means that because nothing is hard coded and, and there's nothing global. Uh, lots and lots of things become dynamic in Bitcoin Core. So I, I would I would love to see the ability to one of the things that would have been really helpful in my testing was was the ability to just kick a node, say you know I, I don't want you connected to me anymore, uh, on the fly, 
and, and uh, limit somebody's bandwidth on the fly. If you notice somebody's uh, sucking up all your bandwidth, you know, lim limit them in particular, but leave everybody else kind of unlocked. So the current status is that it's, it's ugly. And my, my primary intention for programming and, and speaking here was actually to kind of kick off the idea that it is something that I'm working on. It's, it's going to be um, tr trying to get this, this merged into Bitcoin Core will, will be a big, nasty process, I think, because it, it, it'll be a whole lot to try to dump in at once. So I, I would really like to gather some ideas, some uh, talk to some people who have, uh, uh, Matt probably being one of them, people who have, have analyzed uh, network traffic uh, a, a pretty good bit to, to understand pitfalls to avoid in the future to, to try to not make some of the same mistakes that we made. So I am happy to show though in, in the, the, the second most boring graphic. Um, this is something that I ran, I, I, the, the code actually came up two days ago. And so I, I, I uh, this is a, a, an initial block download where you can see it, it downloaded about um, one and a quarter gigs worth of data. And I had set a, a throttle of uh, one meg per second of a download limit. And you can see that that number was hit pretty much exactly. So at, at least that part does work. So. I, I, I do have a plan for trying to get it merged in, but it's going to be ugly. So as far as daydreaming goes, once, once we do have a new network manager, I, th I think that uh, it, it opens up some very interesting possibilities. One, I was, I was talking to Jonas about this last night, I, I think this is, uh, th this is important going forward. Since the, since the network connections would be instanced, or, or the, the manager would be instanced, it would, it would become possible to say, um, Run, run two different sets of services at once. So say I, I run, uh, I, I adver advertise node network on this side and on the other side, or on, on another simultaneous port, I advertise uh, node, node bloom or um, any of the other server features that you would wanna run. So you, you don't necessarily have to be, be static about it. It could also give the ability to, you, you, could, you could start as a prune known, prude node um, and, until you acquire all the blocks, at which point you could dynamically say, I'm, I'm a full node now, you, you, can grab, uh, you can grab blocks from me. So lots of interesting things beyond that. I, I think a, a, a Cursus GUI to be able to interact would, would be very helpful for people to run um, BBSs. Unix sockets, I have, I have no idea how that would be helpful, but it, it could be possible. Out of process networking would be the same way. I don't, I don't imagine how that could possibly be useful, but who knows. So again, my, my primary intention here is to, to kind of introduce the idea and hope that I can talk to you about some of the issues that you guys have run into. Uh, anybody who runs nodes with lots of connections or runs a bunch of nodes and, and has have, have run into networking issues, please find me and talk to me about it. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. All right. Now that we're all awake again, uh, before we go to the next pre presenter, um, I just arrived and I woke up and I just wanted to get a chance to know you guys because I see a lot of San Francisco faces, but I see a lot of other strange humans from other parts. So I'm just gonna ask, who's here from Iran? <laughs> who's here from New York? You brave people, my goodness, awesome. Um, who's here from Europe? Woo, Europe in the house. That's right. Um, who's here from Asia? Pindar, all right, welcome, cool. There we go, more, more, all right. Um, anybody from the, where? Australia, all right. <laughs> awesome, well, uh, great to have you guys here, welcome. I know you've been welcome before. Um, I know that uh, we're running a little bit uh, early, so um, what I just wanted to say was that um, we have a hashtag called Scaling Bitcoin, so please use it. Um, we, we are proud to announce that you've all overloaded the Wi-Fi, so um, please be considerate. If you're not using it, sign off or turn off your... Huh? No, <laughs> turn off your Bitcoin notes. 
<laughs> no eight megabyte testing. <laughs> All right, um, not a lot of people understand that joke. Okay, um, so also we're gonna have a coffee break and of course you guys know we're gonna have the breakout sessions and oh my God, is that Peter Todd? Peter, please, I want your babies. Okay, um, and <laughs> Um, so uh, I think what I wanted to do is just remind you guys, um, uh, this is the first time we will meet many of each other in this type of uh, sort of session. So please, if you see somebody you don't know, uh, shake a hand and say, hey, uh, you know, I do cool stuff. I know you do cool stuff. Tell me about it. Um, and the coffee break will be a great time to meet each other because I have a feeling what's going to happen here is there's going to be a lot of cool stuff and a lot of cool people doing things after. So please, if, if you want a business development person in your next startup. No, I'm just joking. Um, so if you guys don't know what I do, um, my company is called Serica, and we're PayPal for cannabis, and we use Bitcoin. So um, we've been doing that, and um, we depend on the blockchain and everything you do here to keep us alive and to keep us running a separate rail. So um, everything here is important. Please do connect. And with that, I hear Rusty is coming. I hear Rusty. Rusty, is that you? Can we, come on, give it up, this guy, all right. Woo! Ooh, it's a Mac. Okay, everyone can hear me? Great. Hi, I'm Rusty. Um, this is not what I do, but um, I was doing it anyway, so I'm here to talk about it. Um, the problem is currently basically blocks are transmitted in their entirety. Uh, if you're like me and you have a one megabit uplink and you're connecting your node to eight peers, your first peer will see a one meg block in about 66.8 seconds, right? That's significantly slower than you'd expect. The last one is about 76.4 seconds because we basically blast out blocks in parallel to all our peers. Um, now, miners can solve this problem of slow block transmission, for example, by centralizing and all using the same pool. That's not necessarily desirable, so it would be nice if we could take advantage of some of the redundancies in the block. Now, under normal circumstances, of course, most of the contents of the block is known to the peers. Um, it doesn't help for worst case. Worst case, you can always create a block that no one's seen before. Uh, but it does help for the normal case. But a really naive approach to this, like sending TX IDs, potentially adds some round trip latency, so you want to avoid that. So the first approach to this was, was Gavin's uh, O1 block propagation gist, um, which Gives them the URL there. Um, it uses an IBLT. I Googled image search for IBLT, and that's what I got. Um, obviously, internet, bacon, lettuce, tomato. Um, so invertible bloom lookup table to encode a, encode a block for transmission. So basically what you do is you take a, uh, IBLT deals with constant sizes. So you split um, your transaction into fragments that look something like this. They have a fragment ID an index, which is the number for the fragment, and then the actual data. Um, those of you familiar with bloom tables will know basically you take three hash functions, you throw the uh, fragment into your, uh, your, your uh, bloom filter there. In this case, we keep a counter as well as XORing in. And then we do the same thing with our second fragment, and there you can see, thanks to the wonders of SVG, the A and B are XORed over each other, and there's a two counter on that bucket. We do that for all the fragments. Uh, we end up with something that looks like this, which of course is an oversaturated bloom table, which is useless to everyone. Um, so one side basically does that for the entire block, sends it to the peer. Uh, the peer creates what they guess to be the, the equivalent IBLT, and the subtraction of that is relatively trivial. So you XOR the main parts and you subtract the counters, and you'll end up with a difference. And hopefully that's not oversaturated, and then you can extract out the buckets. The buckets have count minus one means you put a transaction in your block guess that wasn't in the real block, so you pull out all those fragments. If the count is one, then that means there's an unknown transaction in the block. You pull that fragment out. If you end up with an empty IBLT when you've basically done this um, dissolution, um, you then try to form the block out of that. That's IBLT in a nutshell. Now, we've done some minor improvements. I'm not going to go through them, but basically there's some optimizations and other things on the original uh, proposal that have been coded up. Um, I don't have good numbers on how much each, each of these buys you. Uh, but I do want to point out, uh, Keller Rosenbaum was really good uh, collaborating with this stuff and throwing ideas around on various different things that we could do. Um, and we've got a thread running between the two of us at the moment on doing some more measurements 
on the net effects. Um, but more interestingly, it turns out creating this IBLT is really fast. Uh, it's order of the number of transactions uh, in the block. Um, there's a twist that we use that makes that an order n log n factor in there, but it's still really, really fast. So Peter Wille suggested, why don't we just use this for encoding between peers rather than the miner setting it up and spraying it out to the network. You would use this to encode a block to your direct peers, uh, potentially differently for each peer. So the question then comes down to scaling. How well does this kind of approach scale? It scales as the difference in mempool with some factor. Obviously, if you knew exactly what the other person didn't have, um, that would be the most efficient way. Uh, and there was so, so there's some encoding penalty for throwing blocks into the uh, IBLT. It depends on whether there are extra blocks or missing, sorry, extra transactions or missing transactions. Uh, the rate is about one to 2.2 factor there. Um, the difference in mempool roughly scales with the transaction bit rate. The more transactions flowing through the network, the more likely you are to have missing or extra transactions in the other person's mempool. So uh, that's the rough scaling property. Um, the issue that comes up then is this helps, it helps against the centralization problem in one sense, in that obviously, you know, um, there's less pressure on miners to, col to collaborate into single pools because they've got faster block transmission. Um, but it does put pressure on homogenization because this scheme works best if your mempools are identical, uh, which potentially opens the doors to things like censorship. So we really wanted a trade off. Um, you do need to have some heuristic to indicate what transactions are likely to be in the block. They can't throw the entire mempool into their IBLT because if their mempool's over full, there's gonna be way too much in the IBLT. Even when you do the subtraction, they'll end up with a lot of junk. Uh, so you do need some heuristics, um, but you need a fairly compact heuristic to give them an idea of what kind of things they should put in their IBLT to do the, to the subtraction. <sighs> with the aim to making reasonable mining variations, whatever that means, uh, as efficient as possible. Okay. So this is kind of what we came up with. Um, you first send basically your minimum Satoshi per byte, or Satoshi per kilobyte, or for 4K, whatever scale set. So this assumes that miners are basically profit maximizing. So they've picked some level and I've gone, you know, if it pays more than this, I'll include it in my block. Um, and then basically you say, oh, here are the transactions I, that were actually below that, but I included them anyway. That's your priority area. Um, and here are transactions which were above that line in my mempool, but I did not include them for some reason. Um, now, importantly, you don't have to send the TX IDs for that. Uh, those two can compactly be represented as bit prefixes. So even if you have, say, a million transactions in your mempool, it still only costs you 20 bits for each of those. So that, those sending those excluded and uh, included TXs is actually pretty cheap. So uh, if you try this, um, about six months ago, I uh, hacked up Bitcoin D to dump mempools every time it received a block and every time it received a transaction uh, and ran it on four nodes around the world, one in Singapore, uh, one in, Singapore, one in Australia, um, two in San Francisco, one of which was on the Relay network. Um, so I have up on GitHub there, uh, Bitcoin Corpus, which is a week of mempool data. Uh, for all these peers, uh, sorry, all these nodes. Now, if we pretend they were peers and they were, they were running this protocol, we can kind of simulate what we would expect. Uh, if we use 128 byte fragment size, the jury's still out on what the optimal size is, but that seems to be in the ballpark. Um, instead of transmitting everyone to everyone else, which would be about 482 meg, we send, and this is best case, this is using the smallest, iterating till we find the smallest possible IBLT we could send and still get the data across, we would send about 3% of that. So there are potentially some real upsides to this approach, which is good to know. Um, here's a good block. Um, we, I got lucky. Uh, there's a, a streak of, um, uh, of, of um, what do we call it now? Uh, these days it's called, the cool kids call it stress testing. Uh, random fluctuations in the network that cause full blocks. Um, so here's a good block. Um, it's almost a megabyte long, of which you can see everything but the coin base is already in our mempool. This is the easiest possible case. Um, we have 1, 1.2, 1.3 megs in our mempool. Um, and um, basically to send to the three peers, this is actually the Australian 
uh, case sending to the other peers, they send about 2K each or 4K for one of them. Um, and the reason is that we actually guessed the minimum transaction fee wrong. So we actually sent a lot of extra bits that we didn't need. But it's still, that's pretty tight. I and mean, we were sending two or 4K to get a one meg block. Here's a bad case. Uh, it's a 100K block. Um, 84K of that is transactions we've never seen before. Uh, we've got 1.4 meg, uh, sorry, we've only got, sorry, only 137K in the mempool. Uh, and the best possible case is actually larger than the block itself which obviously we wouldn't do, but for testing it's interesting. So you can't do much about this. If you haven't seen the transactions before, you've got to send them. In this case, you'd probably just send it in the clear. Um, now, uh, IBLT encodes what's in the block, but it doesn't encode the order. Uh, Gavin suggested a fairly arbitrary, you know, pick an order and, and make sure you put your block in that order so that you don't have to transmit that information. Um, I want to float out there that there's this idea we could order by uh, fee per kilobyte, uh, if we're picking an arbitrary order any, anyway, there are a couple of things that we could do then. If you have a commitment to the minimum fee value uh, and a number of transactions below and above, you could, um, that would allow some fee determination for SPV. If you also put in there the number of blocks, number of transactions which are dependent, you could actually SPV prove that that value is correct, in fact. Um, this would, Basically, uh, a commitment like that would allow um, a lightweight wallet to have some insight into fee levels, uh, which I think would be interesting. But there's another idea out there that's kind of orthogonal to uh, IBLT, uh, and that is the idea of propagating weak blocks. What you do is, when, you, when a miner hits a block that's only a 20th of the difficulty target, they broadcast that. Um, so you get a whole series of weak blocks before you get a real block. Um, the trick here is the network encoding allows, when you send that weak block, you say, well, it's just like the previous weak block, only I've made these updates since then. Um, now that kind of encoding is most efficient if it can represent whole ranges from the previous block. That's most likely to happen if you've ordered by fee, fee per byte. Um, so from that point of view, it probably optimizes your uh, weak block encoding. Okay. Last slide. Okay. Now, we can actually test this without any minor support, without any changes today. Uh, and this is my kind of vague plan. We cheat and we send the accompanying ordering information. So we pretend that the block was in our nice canonical order, but we tack on the actual ordering information so that you can use it today. Um, we guesstimate what the min fee is. Um, you can use some heuristics to figure out what's the minimum amount of data you'll have to send given a certain min fee. Um, the idea of a protocol like this is that you would be in contact with your peers when you send them a block. They would send you some feedback on how close it was to their mempool. So over time, you get an idea of how convergent your mempools are. In my data set, the mempools are extremely convergent. Um, but if you ran that today, uh, I know your mempools would probably be extremely divergent. Uh, if you've got a node that's just rebooted, for example, that will obviously have a very different mempool. Um, so you do a running estimate of that. And then when you receive a block, you look at how different was that from my mempool. You add an estimate of how different it is to the other peer's mempool. And on that, you base your IBLT size. And if that's smaller than the block, you use IBLT encoding and you send that, aiming for about a 95% chance that they can reconstruct it. You have to pick a number. Um, you need infinite data to guarantee. Uh, so you pick 95% on the theory that they will receive the block from multiple sources, and they can always fall back, if necessary, to a normal get block. So that potentially a path forward and something that I'd like to have done before Hong Kong, for example. Excellent. We're all done. Thank you, Rusty. That was awesome. OK, so we are running early, which is good, which means that you guys and us get to go for coffee right now and come back in 20 minutes. So the program says 10.20. But if you come back in 20 minutes, that means we could even finish earlier and then get drinks. So coffee, let's do it. All right. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Give yourself a clap. Come on, let's do it. Yay. <laughs> Woo! Bitcoin. Oh yeah. <laughs>